May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My friends at St. John's Episcopal Church, Grand Haven, it is wonderful to be back with you. I might have met a few of you this summer when I was here as supply and started to discover the riches of your liturgy. But it is wonderful to be with you this morning and get a chance to actually worship in a congregation in this context when Plain Song Farm is in the prayers of the people and you'll be praying for me soon. So I really, I don't have serve a congregation anymore, so this is a treat for me and I'm grateful. So I am the executive director of Plain Song Farm and Ministry. I, I promise I'm getting to the readings, but I think you should know some things first. <laughs> We're an agency of the Episcopal Church up in Rockford, just north of Grand Rapids. And our mission is to cultivate connections between people, places, and God as a place that nurtures belonging and the radical renewal of God's world. Plain Song Farm was founded with a hypothesis that maybe people that weren't comfortable coming into a church but still wanted to continue a spiritual journey would feel comfortable coming to a farm and hearing about Jesus there. And that hypothesis has proven true over seven years. One of the goals that we had when we began was to make a place that was particularly hospitable to younger generations. And one of our signature programs is a residential service learning experience. So I will say, if you know anyone between 21 and 30 that wants to live an intentional community and make a difference for those around them and it, in, ensuring equity and access for food and healing for planet, starting in January, I want to talk to them. So, but that's a, that's a sidebar. But one of the benefits of beginning this ministry is that it has put me, I'm 51 years old, I'm in regular contact with people who are 20 and 30 years younger than I am. And it's in a context where like, we invite them to tell the truth and for people my age to listen. And I'm so blessed and disturbed by what I've learned. Maybe because we're a creation care agency, one of the things that I consistently hear from people who are younger than I am is the urgency of climate change as an issue in their lives. One of our program participants, Anna West, last year spoke to our diocesan convention. And when she did, she said that she had selected our program because it was, I can't remember whether she said the only or, or one of the few, but I think she said the only, place where she could be a Christian in a place that was seriously concerned about climate. It disturbed me to hear her say that, even as it encouraged me that we had become what I was hoping we would be. It disturbed me because there should be many places where it's obvious that as Christians we care about climate, but they weren't obvious to her. And even as we gather this morning, wildfires rage in California and Pakistan is underwater because climate change isn't a future possibility. It's a present reality. And you and I are disciples of Jesus Christ. And that means we have a unique role to play in this historical moment. It is essential for our eyes to be open and for our hearts to be open to see what God would have us see, and to listen for what God would have us do so that we can be faithful to the vocation we receive in our baptism. When we're baptized, we say we're going to renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God. Well, that's very relevant for climate change. We say we're going to turn to Christ and put our whole faith and trust in him and proclaim not just by word, but by example, Christ's good news. And that is relevant to climate change. And the text that we hear today, see, I told you I was getting there. The text that we hear today show us one step forward on that path. 
So today we heard three lessons. We heard from the prophet Jeremiah, we heard from the apostle Paul, and we heard from our Lord Jesus Christ. And each of them speak in a particular context. And I don't have time to talk all about the context, so I'm just like tiny snippets. The prophet Jeremiah is speaking at a time of crisis for his people. The people of Israel have gone wrong. They have been faithless to the covenant that they had with God. They are going to suffer the consequences. This is at a time when Israel is about to be or is being conquered by a foreign country, by Babylon, and sent into exile, away from their homes and every place that they love, and away from the place where they relate to God. Jeremiah cries out to the people, first telling them to turn aside from their ways, but then later reminding them that even as they suffer and feel alienated, God loves them, God wants them to be restored, and God wants them to live in peace with the place where they are and the peoples around them. We also hear, I could keep going on that, but there's more in the sermon, so I can't, sorry. I'm apologizing to myself, I guess, I don't know. So we also hear from the Apostle Paul, the author of the letter to Timothy. And as that lesson began, he tells us to pray for kings and queens and everyone in authority so that we can live quiet and godly and peaceable lives. But what he doesn't say, because it's totally obvious to the people he's writing to, is that none of those kings or queens or people in authority are disciples of Jesus Christ. I mean, everybody knows that at the time, but we forget that in our time. We're used to, you know, I guess it's King Charles III now, defender of the faith. But for Paul, he is praying for the conversion of those who are in authority so that they will stop persecuting him, imprisoning him, arresting him, flogging him, and all of the other disciples of Jesus who are following a path of faith against the culture that is around them. And Paul sees his suffering as part of God's work of redemption because he knows he's following his call and he doesn't see the long-range consequences. He sees the next faithful step, the next faithful step, the next faithful step. Now, without we, my friends, we are some of Paul's long-range consequences. So we need to keep that in mind, that that's possible when you take one, one, one faithful step. And then Jesus tells us about a dishonest manager and an unethical owner. The whole sermon could be about this. When we hear this story, it just is full of surprises. Surely the rich man is going to be upset. His dishonest and incompetent manager is intentionally swindling him. He, he, he deserves to be fired, and he also deserves to be reprimanded. But instead, this owner says, you know, well done. You looked out for yourself. Which tells us everything about that unethical owner and maybe how much attention he had been paying for quite a while ahead of time, not that much. He was out looking for himself. The lesson that we gain from this story is about what true wealth is. It isn't about what the amount is on your bank balance. It's about the relationships that you have with people in your lives. And it's about the relationship that you have with God. Jesus ends that lesson by saying, you can't serve both wealth and God. If you're putting wealth first in your life, you're compromising your relationship with God. And if you put your relationship with God first in your life, it is going to make you think completely differently about your material possessions. And these scripture lessons speak to us today. 
because we have something in common with the people of Israel whose actions and inactions led them to be going into exile. Our exile happens right where we are in a world with a changing climate. Not so much in Michigan, which honestly we are, we have a lot of privilege in this state as it relates to climate change, which we need to be mindful of. But I talked to my 80-something-year-old mother, God bless you, mother, you are watching on the live stream, I'm not trying to out you. <laughs> I talk to her every night, and she has lived in Northern California for 30 years. She is literally listening on the live stream, I, and so uh, if I offend you, uh, I did ask your permission before, before saying this. Um, so when she moved to California 30 years ago, there were maybe five hot days a year. And a wildfire was highly unusual. But now every summer brings more hot days than can be counted. And there always is like the possibility that a heat wave is around the corner. And wildfires are just, now there's wildfire season. Now there's time to look and see what's going on with that part of where people live. I have met people who moved out of California because of climate change, moved to the Great Lakes. It is already happening. And in the United States, our lives are good compared to the situation of the people in Pakistan. They didn't just lose their homes when the waters rose, they also lost a season's worth of crops. So even when the waters recede, they will depend on the kindness of other countries simply to eat. As the prophet Jeremiah says, hark the cry of my poor people from far and wide. Climate change is happening because we people, we live in ways that those who developed these ways for us did not understand the long-term consequences of their actions. We receive a culture from people who reached beyond wise boundaries. And we as Christians have a story for that. It's the Garden of Eden story. And we know that our human ancestors reach beyond wise boundaries and that God provides real life consequences and also says, I love you, now start again. The earth is the Lord's. It isn't ours to destroy. When we belong to the earth, that's what we read in Genesis 2. Whatever happens to nature happens to us. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, most people would rather see a sermon than hear one, especially about a difficult and thorny issue. So I want to invite you to come and visit to Plainsong Farm because God made us something to see. I, we're not done but we're something. Come for our harvest party on the afternoon of Sunday, October 16th. Come and discover how God is actually at work here and now for the healing of creation. Come and see that you have a place as Episcopalians in Western Michigan, as part of the reconciliation of all things in and through Jesus Christ, this Episcopal ministry. And maybe you can't come to the farm, so I offer you one other simple thing that you can do that makes a difference. Talk about climate change as a Christian. Talk about it. Climate scientist and Christian Catherine Hayhoe says, just being public about a concern that you have for the climate is enough to make things different. Because greater public awareness is the first step toward wiser public policy. And the challenges we face are so big that they are going to be handled at policy levels, not individual levels. At individual levels, we can pray, we can take small actions, and we can talk to those who we care about. Because we too are called to follow in the steps of Jeremiah who spoke God's truth, and of Paul, who prayed for those in authority, not only that they would be peaceable, but that they would change their ways. 
And we are called to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, who taught us to put not wealth, but the love of God first in our lives. Who knows what can be different hundreds of years from now if one person takes one small, faithful step forward? That person is you. That person is me. That pe those people are us. We have been baptized into the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and sent forth to breathe the Spirit of God in this world. We are going to fail and fail and fail. And thanks be to God, we are going to begin again. In the name of Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.